Hey y'all, welcome back. Hey there, this is Rita. Welcome back. This is Amanda. Uh, you're listening to the podcast, I Don't, I don't know, know Her, where we talk about women you probably should know, but you don't. And you're gonna find out. <laughs> okay, so uh, the election just happened, midterms. Yes. And there were a lot of women who won. The most in history. Yeah, more than 100 women have been added to Congress. And, you know, Stacey Abrams is still fighting the good fight down in Georgia, trying to make sure every vote counts. And I hope she ends up the winner. I hope so, too. That race is so close. So is the race between Andrew Gillum and Brian Kemp in Florida. That's still going on? Okay. Uh, Well, after Thursday or Friday, the votes had gotten to the point where both of them were under... They they were within 0.4% of each other. My goodness. And that really shows, too, that every vote does count. Mm -hmm. Do not throw your vote away. Please don't. Please don't. I have a real interesting lady for us to talk about today. Yeah? You want to go first? (laughs) So my wife was like, don't do that one. And I have put it off for the last three weeks. Really? And I was like, fuck it. (gasps) I'm doing her. Mm, I like it. Fuck okay. it. <laughs> I'm excited. Yeah. All okay, right. so I'll All go right. first. I am going to talk today about Isadora Duncan. I don't know her. The what mother, a beautiful name, know, by the way. way. The mother of modern dance. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. All right. Isadora was born May 26th, 1877, or May 27th, 1878. Okay, so question mark. Yep. No problem. In San Francisco. Here's why people don't know exactly when she was born. Most people believe she was born in 1878, but in the 1970s, someone found her baptism certificate, and it was stamped May 26th, 1877, which is a year before she was born. Born. So I would go with the the latter then. Yeah, she was a time traveler, maybe? (laughs) She was that modern. (laughs) (laughs) Her father was a banker, a mining engineer, and a lover of the arts, and her mother was a music teacher. Oh, that's wonderful. However, soon after Isadora was born, her father was caught in illegal bank dealings, and that led to her parents' divorce. And then she and her three siblings were raised by their mother in relative poverty. Oh, wow. I wonder, did he go to jail, I wonder? I think so. I was trying to figure that out for sure. But it didn't. I didn't see any concrete evidence that he went to jail. But I'm. Mm-hmm. I would imagine if he was caught, that implies that there was legal ramifications. Yeah. Her sister Elizabeth was also a dancer. They both started dancing immediately as soon as they could walk. As a child, Isadora rejected what she considered the rigidity of classical ballet. Oh wow. Uh, she felt like everything was too prescriptive. Mm-hmm. And it all looked the same. And They're she also... Hence boring. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And she also felt like ballet was, uh, was too mechanical, too technical, instead of letting the music flow through your body. Hmm. So when she started listening to composers like Beethoven, Brahms, and Wagner, she would like let the rhythms and the, and the movements make her move. Mm-hmm. Very so, natural. Yes, very yeah. natural. And by the age of six, she was teaching movement to the neighborhood children. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine seeing that outside, this little girl? like With all uh, these other little kids <laughs> surrounding her? Yeah. And you're like, what is the cult? <laughs> what are you selling? <laughs> <laughs> by the time she was 10, her classes were huge. 10 years old. Mm-hmm. Get it, girl. She and her sister ended up leaving asking permission to leave public school to focus on dance and earn money as dance teachers in their mother's music school. Oh, wow. So their mom agreed. Mom pulled them both out of public school. They ended up getting a tutor to get their education, but they taught dance classes and that's how they all stayed afloat. Wow. So she taught dance in a way that was different from everyone else. She wanted dancers to use their bodies freely, and she didn't believe in planning choreography. Oh, cool. Very spontaneous. Yeah, so as she would be teaching a class, she would be making up the new thing. Oh, that's awesome. (laughs) I could so be a modern dancer. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, me too, actually. I I think I could do this. I think it sounds like something I could do, yeah. It made me wonder, though, if that's how she taught, 
if that was like the choreography was never planned, mm-hmm. then did they do something different each time? I would assume. Or did did it as it went, like as she went, did she like go, oh, this is how this should be. Mm-hmm. Now that's how we'll repeat doing it. I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah. So she really wanted to travel. So she decided that she would leave California and move to Chicago. And then she moved to New York where she had joined, joined the Augustine Daily Dance Company. Cool. But she just didn't have a lot of success in the U.S. And she thought maybe Europe would be better for her. Mm-hmm. So she scraped together as much as she could, which wasn't a lot of money. And she got on a boat to go to England. But she couldn't afford to go on a passenger ship. Oh, my goodness. What did she go on? <laughs> a, a cattle boat. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> so she's on like a boat full of cows heading over to England. Fancy. <laughs> so when she got to England, she had never before seen the kind of museums and art that Europe had to offer because mm-hmm. America is such a young country. And so she was going into all of these museums in England and seeing all of these statues and paintings from ancient Greece and Rome. And she was really captured by the way that they looked, even though they were, you know, sedentary, they were statues, they were stationary. You could imagine the movement. So if you think about like the way that Greek gods and goddesses and people Athenians were portrayed in terms of their clothing. Mm-hmm. Their clothing was always that like really free mo- yeah, moving. Yeah, flowing, draping. Yeah. Yeah, flowy and drapey. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> so she saw all of this and she thought that there was a kind of freedom and movement that she wanted to capture in her dance. So she took her inspiration from these paintings and sculptures that she saw. So she began cultivating her own new dance method where she also, in addition to this like free flowing movement Mm -hmm. and this real, like just expressive. Sounds very romantic too. Right. Yeah. Also, this was a rejection of classical ballet and in classical ballet, all of the dancers wore these like super tight corsets, Mm -hmm. very revealing, tiny little skirts that were cinched to, you know, so you could barely breathe and the point shoes. Yeah. Right. That like kill your feet. She was like, fuck all that shit. (laughs) So she decided that they should all wear free-flowing gauzy dresses. Ooh. They would just like cling to her skin. Ooh. Oh, yeah. (laughs) And she danced barefoot. Oh, I love it. So her dance started... That's so also like childlike and playful. I agree. And if you think about like she started dancing when she was basically walking and that's how she learned to move Mm -hmm. was with this freedom. Again, we think of dance as this like huge multifaceted discipline that has many, many, many different branches. Mm -hmm. But at the time, the only kind of dancers that got paid were ballet. Ballet. And that's the only thing people went to go see. There were obviously other cultures that had other kinds of dancing happening in them, but nobody was going to shows to see those dances. Mm -hmm. So she started to really diversify her dancing. And one of the things she liked to have in her dancing is skipping. Oh, wow. (laughs) And jumping and leaping (laughs) and running. Skipping and jumping and leaping and running. (laughs) Which are not not at all acceptable in ballet, at least at this time, you know. Yeah. You could do lifts, things like that, but you Mm -hmm. weren't, you know, you didn't really do these like, just leaps around <laughs> skipping. Could you imagine the the people that thought she was insane? I would I was just gonna say like <laughs> skipping is probably the one that just sounds craziest to me. Yeah. You know, if you were if you were the kind of person who thought that didn't belong in dance, you'd be like mortified. Yeah. So uh she was often compared to a dancing woodland nymph. Oh. Her dancing invoked like natural movement mimicked the ancient Greek dances that were in classical art. So the dances that they would perform for like Dionysus. Oh, wow. The god of wine. There'd be these beautiful paintings of dancers, often naked or wearing very little. And so she really wanted to invoke that Mm -hmm. kind of 
classical timelessness in her dance. And she also, she looked at dance the same way that people look at paintings. She thought dance is a high art. Mm -hmm. And in order to bring other people to the table to believe that as well, she wanted it to look like high art. Okay. So again, that styling, that movement, that grace, that freedom she's putting into her dance. So in Europe, especially, but also eventually in America, classical ballet was starting to fall out of favor with audiences. They were okay. like looking for something new, probably. Mm-hmm. And women in particular loved Isadora's style because traditional ballet dancers were often very scantily clad and they were sponsored by wealthy men. That's gross. You know yeah. what that is. You know what that is. <laughs> yeah, these men would find these you know, dancers who wanted to make their living doing the art that they love and obviously take advantage of them and put them in outfits and for their own pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Because these women became their, their playthings, their dolls. Mm -hmm. And if you wanted to be a dancer, that was how you could do it. That's sad. It was gross. So her feminist style, this like really, aggressively free Mm -hmm. I would say you know with the lack of shoes and the hardly wearing any clothing but of her own making yeah that was really that really appealed to women audiences she also said that she was really influenced and inspired by the sea Ooh, and she wanted to mimic the The way that waves waves undulate in her body I hope I'm painting a picture. (laughs) Amazing. I actually watched some videos of her dancing, like actually her dancing. Oh, wow. And it was captivating. Really? I I, will put them up on our social media. But if you also just want to Google her or YouTube her, Isadora Duncan, the grace and the freedom. And also there was a little bit of like whimsy in the way that she would dance. Mm Mm-hmm. It was really captivating. Just, I I really felt like I understand now why this changed dance so much. I would almost, like for me, I'm picturing like emulating nature. Like, aren't we all captivated by nature? Mm -hmm. Like we love to watch the ocean and sit there and and be peaceful and calm. And it's very, um, I don't want to say basic in a bad way, but but it's very simple and natural and natural beauty and grace, which is awesome. If you think about it, water has always, almost always been associated with femininity. So she was tapping into a deeper unconsciousness in humans. That actually has to do with like the womb. Yeah. The sound that when you're in the womb, the sound of the ocean, right? That like Mm -hmm. movement of water and liquid. So she took all of these things like ancient greek mythology and gods and goddesses and the art of the classical era and and then the art of ballet and also the beauty of the sea and the natural movement and then put it into dance so it's really incredible what she did and also the american ideal of freedom because she was an american Mm -hmm. right so this idea of this like untethered freedom was also part of her energy and her dance. Mm -hmm. She started out dancing when she went to Europe, she started out dancing in the living rooms of wealthy people. Oh my goodness. (laughs) And their patronage, like, like they would have a dinner party, right? Yeah. And and they'd be like, our entertainment for the evening is American dancer, Isadora Uh Duncan. And they would all, oh, clap and, oh, oh, it's so lovely. <laughs> How exotic. <laughs> and they would pay her yeah. for, for her art. And she became more and more popular and their patronage started to allow her to move into theaters and dance halls. And soon enough, it was sold out everywhere she went. Wow. So she went on tour in Europe and she sold out almost every show she did all across Europe. And she decided, I've conquered Europe. I'm going (laughs) back home. Where am I going next? So she decided to come back to the U.S. and tour there as well. She started to become the inspiration for artists, like painters. Oh. And a lot of famous painters went to watch her dance. And then they would create paintings of her dance. 
Wow. Including Rodan. Whoa. <laughs> Isn't that funny how cyclical that is? Like she became inspired by paintings yeah. and sculptures, created this new form of dance, and the painters started to model their paintings after her, on dance. her dance. Yeah. How that's all just keyed in. She decided to open up a school of dance in Germany in 1904, and she initially took in six girls to be her protégés. This is very weird. We're okay. about to take a turn. Okay. In 1919, she adopted all six of these girls, and they all changed their last names to Duncan, and they became and? known as the Isadorables. <laughs> okay, I feel I I feel like that. That's like an afternoon snack treat or something. <laughs> also, I feel like we've returned to the idea of a cult. Okay. <laughs> because that's weird. Um, yeah, that's strange, y'all. These six girls were absolutely devoted to this woman and would just listen to every single word she said and did anything she wanted. And It's it, a little cultish. It's a little yeah. culty to me. The East Adorables. <laughs> so around this time when she's... So she's got this dance school. She's got her six protégés. They go on to start leading the dance classes. She's still touring as a dancer. She begins traveling with a companion. Ooh. Named We've M- all had companions, y'all. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Especially us in the closet. She started traveling with a companion named Mary Dempsey, who also went by the name Mary Diesti or simply Desti. Hmm. I'm thinking they were fucking. Yeah. <laughs> there was no evidence that she was, that they were having a sexual relationship. But I know a lot about Isadora, and I would say probably. Yeah. My meter's going off. <laughs> also, because Isadora around this time is like, she already had rejected a whole lot of social norms about mm-hmm. what you were supposed to wear as a dancer and what you're supposed to look like and how you're supposed to move. That wasn't just in her dance life. This was her philosophy of life in general. She was an atheist. She did not believe in marriage at all. I was going to say, I I find it highly unlikely that this girl was married. No, she refused to get married. And she ended up actually having two children out of wedlock. Gasp. With two different men. Gasp. (laughs) We're talking the early 1900s. That is scandalous. I like it. Yeah, she would constantly be in the tabloids. Wow. In the gossip pages of, you know, in New York. So her first child was a girl named Deirdre, and she was born in 1906. Her father was Gordon Craig, a theater designer. So obviously you can figure out how they met. Yes. Isidore was also traveled amongst a lot of like wealthy circles, Mm -hmm. you know, because her, her career started as dancing for people in their living rooms, wealthy people. Yeah. And she was a darling of the upper echelon social scene. Okay. Because she was so wild and eccentric. <laughs> they loved having People her People love them some voyeurism too. So the other child she had was a son named Patrick Augustus, and he was born in 1910. His father was Paris Singer, the son of the famous Singer sewing machine creator. What? Yeah. So That's... That's awesome. (laughs) Yeah. And he also was like, I don't want to get married. I mean, can you imagine what that family was probably? They were just probably losing their goddamn mind. They were probably like, what the hell did he? So he did acknowledge that it was his kid because I'm I'm like presuming societal pressures and norms at that time. It to me, it sounds like they they everybody was just, you know, she chose men that understood where her ground was. was. In 1913, both of her children and their nanny died. Oh, my God. After the car they were driving in, riding in, drove into the Seine River in Paris. Just a tragic accident or did something crazy happen? This is like the early time of the automobile. Mm. And it wasn't perfected. And sometimes automobiles would like, you know, something would get stuck. A Mm -hmm. pedal would get stuck. You couldn't unstick it and you'd like run into a tree. You know, people died all the time. There were no seatbelts. There was no roof on a lot of True. cars. Yeah. So her 
kids and the nanny just go careening into the Sun River. And it, it, witnesses were there. Oh, geez. The, all three of them are screaming. Just awful. Terrible. Yeah. She's obviously devastated by this. Yeah, tragic. So she pulls away for a while and she goes to a seaside resort. And I can't remember. I feel like it was in, it was like in Greece or something, but I can't, I couldn't figure out where it was. I'll get to this later, but I know exactly where it was in another book. I just couldn't find it in the book I was looking in. So she's at this seaside resort and she's joined by an actress from America named Eleonora Dews. And Eleonora had previously had a very public lesbian relationship with a prominent feminist. So once again, I'm like, hmm. Mm -hmm. What's with your company? (laughs) I think they're probably fucking. (laughs) Uh, Probably. This is the weirdest story. So the book I was. Tell me she joined the cult. (laughs) (laughs) She created the cult. (laughs) Okay. So this is a really weird story. Rita knows this about me. I have been working on a years-long project researching this very famous American lesbian poet named Mercedes de Acosta, who basically got every famous actress known to man in bed with her at some point (laughs) at that time. So this story came directly from Mercedes' book, but Mercedes isn't always a trustworthy writer, So I went searching for this elsewhere, and this was written about in a lot of places. Okay, you ready for this? It's very fucking weird. Okay, ready. So she's at this seaside resort. She's devastated, lost her children. She's there with this woman that she's probably fucking. Mm -hmm. So she takes a walk down to the beach, and on the beach she sees a man, a very attractive man. And that man's name is Romano Romanelli. And he's a sculptor, but she doesn't know that at the time. She just sees a very handsome man. And she goes over to him and she starts begging him to have sex with her. What? I told you it was weird. (laughs) Okay. So she's like, please, please, please put it in me. Okay. Because sometimes, you know, if you wanted another child. Oh my God. Is that it? Yeah. She wanted another child. So she was like, I really, please, please, please make me a mother again. I don't want anything from you. Just fuck me. Oh my God. That is so tragic. He does. (laughs) Okay. Have sex with her on the beach. So she returns to the house after this encounter and she was like, Eleonora, I met this God of a man and he put it in me. (laughs) (laughs) That's that's a walk (laughs) and Eleanor is like what What? (laughs) bitch you be cray (laughs) so you can probably guess that Eleanor didn't take it well um no no one expects you know your partner to go for a walk and come back you know been had (laughs) so she was furious yeah and she leaves and never speaks to Isadora again wow so Isadora does get pregnant from this encounter jeez And she gives birth to another son on August 13th, 1914. But the baby dies shortly after birth. Oh my gosh. (laughs) So, and also during this time, she gets into pretty bad car accidents. Jeez. But recovers from them. But like at one point, they thought maybe she was never going to be able to dance again. Again, cars were really unsafe back then. So it wasn't really unusual for people to get in car accidents, but the fact that her children died in a car and she got into two car accidents was kind of strange. Mm-hmm. So after all of this has happened, she tries to throw herself into her career again, but oh, bing, bang, boom, it's World War I. Oh, shit. <laughs> she does a small sort of half-assed tour through South America, Germany, and France, and then she's invited to Moscow to start a dance school. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Because at the time, and all of the literature I was reading, like switched back and forth between using Russia and Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. But this is during the time when there was a huge rise of communism, right? Mm -hmm. So she is drawn to Russia because of what was considered leftist policies at the time. She saw the Soviet Union as a big draw that it matched her revolutionary personality. So she starts a dance school and there she meets a poet named Sergei Yezinin and he's 18 years younger than her. Oh, wow. 
She can get that ass. <laughs> she must just, she must she have must just have been so captivating. Something. Yeah. So she wanted him to go on tour with her and he wanted to go, but the U.S. wouldn't let him in because of his because, ties to the Soviet Union yeah. unless he was her husband. Oh, so. <laughs> so on May 22nd, 1922, they marry wow. and he goes on tour with her in the U.S. and Europe. It was literally the worst time in history to bring a Russian to the United States. Yeah. So there was this big paranoia at the time, lots of propaganda against what they called the Red Menace. Mm -hmm. And when she arrived with this very leftist husband of hers, this poet, they were labeled Bolshevik agents. So they were like traitors to the government. Yeah. So that didn't bode well for them at all. And you know what? She didn't help herself out in this regard. Uh, I'm imagining some of that free-flowing energy went a little too (laughs) free-flowy. Oh, yes, it sure did. When she was on stage in Boston. Oh, no, on stage. (laughs) Yes, on stage. She always had a red scarf on. She wanted people to know that she was a red menace. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) So she had this red scarf. And she starts waving it around, and then she tears open one side of her dress to bare her breast to the entire audience, and she screams, this is red, so am I. Oh, my God. (laughs) Oh, no. She got arrested, didn't she? Well, she got in a lot of trouble, that's for sure. (laughs) Okay. And they were like, get the fuck out of this country. Oh, no. You're a traitor. So she left, and the last thing she said was, goodbye, America, I shall never see you again. Hmm. She was right. <laughs> During this time, though, Sergei, the poet, her husband, leaves her. What the fuck? <laughs> and he goes back to Moscow. It's just a year after they got married. And then in 1925, he was found dead in a St. Petersburg hotel room by apparent suicide. Oh, jeez. Around this time in 1924, Isadora met the American poet Mercedes de Acosta, our lovely lesbian Lothario. <laughs> And they embark on a heated affair for quite a few years. And I mean, heated. Yeah. This project that I've been working on, I know a lot about this person. There is a collection in a Philadelphia library museum type place. And you can go in and Mercedes sold all of her personal letters and things like that to Mm -hmm. this museum. And you can read the letters that Isadora wrote her, which I did. Oh, Awesome. Here's uh, here's what one of them said. Nope. Mercedes. You like my voice? Yes. Mercedes. I like the tone change. Mm. <laughs> Mercedes, lead me with your little strong hands and I will follow you to the top of a mountain, to the end of the world, wherever you wish. Damn. Yeah. She was definitely in it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what kind of magic brew Mercedes had going for her, but she got everyone to drink it. (laughs) (laughs) So speaking of drinking, this Mm -hmm. is when Isadora is starting to drink heavily. No, no. Well, every, well, why wouldn't Mm you? Everything is going to shit creek. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is not a good time for her. So she's drinking excessively. She's in this really bad downward spiral, not really dancing anymore. Mm -hmm. And, she has all of those wealthy friends left, right? Yeah. So they start putting her up in apartments all around Paris and the Mediterranean. You know, they're like, oh, maybe if she just has a place to live for a while, she'll get back on her feet. Mm-hmm. And each one of them, as time goes on, is like, oh, fuck, she's a disaster. Yeah. And, and they just sort don't of, want any part of it, probably. Yeah. She just sort of starts hopping from apartment to apartment and everyone like each this friend will put her up for a while and then be like, you got to get the fuck out. And then Mm -hmm. a new friend will put her up. We've all had a friend like that. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Yeah. A friend who like you have all the faith in the world. They'll get their shit together. And then you realize they're never going to get their shit together. Yep. That's Isadora at this point. No, no. So a couple of people were like, you know, she's got this really fascinating life. So they decide to fund her writing her own autobiography. Oh, like this is the way that's going to this is what's going to get her out of this Mm -hmm. rut. So they thought this would lift her out of poverty and her alcoholism, like give her something to focus on. Mm -hmm. So she's doing that with the help of these wealthy friends. She's writing this autobiography, but she's still a shit show. 
So one night, September 14th, 1927, Isidore was out with friends in Nice, France. As she left, she got into a brand new convertible called the Amilcar CGSS. Hmm. I looked at it up online and yeah. it was, a, it's like a convertible. Oh, wow. But imagine a convertible in 1927, right? Like it's not, it's, it's not a great car. It's, no. This is when cars still had open spoked wheels. Oh, jeez. <laughs> And she was wearing this long, flowy, hand-painted red scarf made by the artist Roman Shadov. And it was a gift from Mary Diesti, right? Desti. Mm-hmm. And Mary was like, please don't wear this tonight. It's really cold. Wear a cape. This little scarf isn't going to keep you warm. Mm-hmm. Wear a cape. And Isidore was like, no, I'm wearing my scarf. I want everyone to see my <laughs> flowy see red my scarf. I want hand-painted scarf, Yeah. So as she left, Isadora reportedly said, farewell, my friends, I go to glory. Oh, my goodness. And that became like the lore for a long time. Mm -hmm. But Mary said later, much later, that that's not what Isadora said, that Isadora actually said, I'm off to love, which Mary was super embarrassed by because it implied that Isadora and her driver, Benoit, were going off to a hotel to fuck. Oh, God. (laughs) That's a a less... uh... (laughs) <laughs> Less glamorized yeah it's not so glamorous <laughs> no so it's i'm off to love i'm off to so love. as they're driving away isadora's silk scarf becomes entangled around the open spoked wheels and the rear axle of the car and it pulls isadora's head behind her Ugh. reportedly it actually pulled her from the open car and she broke her neck oh my goodness In the New York Times, her obituary said, According to dispatches from Nice, Duncan was hurled in an extraordinary manner from an open automobile in which she was riding and instantly killed by the force of her fall to the stone pavement. Jeez, that sounds messy. Other people who were there said that she was nearly decapitated by the tightening of her scarf. So I think it was actually probably a little bit of both, if you think about it. Yeah. Because the the scarf is flowing behind her, gets caught in a wheel and starts to tighten, right? And so she's probably choking at this point, Mm -hmm. holding her neck and her neck is going back. And then it's cutting into her skin. Forcefully pulls her out. You're going to have some damage to your neck. Yeah. Yeah, If if it has the ability to pull her entire body weight out, throw her in the air and down to the pavement, then it's definitely cut through. Mm -hmm. So it's both. Yeah. It broke her neck and it almost decapitated her. Ugh. Right? That's gnarly. (laughs) What a way to go. (laughs) Well, that is why, that is actually the thing that makes her the most famous. Really? Is this death. And that's why, that's why my wife was like, don't do her. Because obviously. Just the way she died? Well, because that's the thing that like everybody's like, it's juicy, right? Oh. So that's why I wanted to spend a lot of time really talking about her impact on dance Mm -hmm. and modern dance. Because. The rest of her life is a fucking dramatic mess. Mm -hmm. You know, she's got all these different lovers and all these different, and the kids dying and all the car accidents and the communism and the atheism and the bisexuality and all that stuff makes her super interesting. And her really fucked up death makes her very interesting. Mm -hmm. And so all of those things often overshadow how important she was to Mm -hmm. dance and what she did in terms of creating a whole new form of dance called modern dance yeah her contribution to the genre i i want to just acknowledge that there could be some african-american dancer who was doing the same thing at the same time and they just never got recognition that's totally possible Mm -hmm. but this is the person that we know for sure popularized a brand new style of dance Mm -hmm. that's one thing i've been noticing about the the couple um i mean if you've been following listeners um the episodes that we've done it's not like women weren't doing this it's just we're pointing out who's been recognized first so it just makes me curious sometimes like who was doing it before yeah yeah i agree there's probably somebody out there that we just don't know about yet yeah so uh i told you that she traveled in like lots of wealthy well-known circles in new york one of the people in that upper echelon circle was lesbian poet gertrude stein Oh. Who, after Isadora's death, said, affectations can be dangerous. <laughs> Which I love. Oh, my God. That is amazing. Like, her, her love of a scarf is what killed her. Oh, my God, Gertrude. <laughs> <laughs> K- 
catty catty. <laughs> so at the time of her death, Isadora was a Soviet citizen. And her will was the first Soviet citizen's will to be probated in a U.S. court. Oh, wow. She was cremated and her ashes were placed next to her children's in Paris. Here's another layer of tragedy. Even her, after her death? Ugh. Okay. Her autobiography, which was called My Life, was published the year she died and was resoundingly hailed as an artistic masterpiece. Oh, my goodness. So that could have... It could have brought, her, could out have of brought her out of everything. Yeah. But she wasn't around long enough to know that critics loved it. It sold a lot of copies. It was apparently very well written. Like she was actually hmm. a very talented writer too. Could really tell a compelling story. Well, yeah. I mean, obviously as a personality and as a dancer, I could imagine that she could put that down on paper. No problem. I think it's, it's just so hard to imagine that, you know, this, this one thing that might be your saving grace, it could have been, but you died before it, it yeah. saved you. So the Isadorables. <laughs> <laughs> Back to the Isadorables. <laughs> the Isadorables continued her dance legacy after her death. They opened and led schools across Europe and the United States. And she ended up paving the way for all modern dance. So after her death, her life and her crazy ass personality mm -hmm. lived on in a number of novels, memoirs, nonfiction books, songs, poems, films, and on stage. Wow. There are mentions of her everywhere, even in things that like you wouldn't imagine. So that's pretty cool. That's fascinating. Yeah. She's a fascinating lady. She is. Yeah. And I, so when I asked Abby, Oh, hey, what do you think about me talking about the atheist, uh, openly bisexual <laughs> communist dancer <laughs> with a crazy death? She was like, um, <laughs> <laughs> but wasn't it fascinating? It is fascinating. And, you know, tragedy happens. And it I seems to follow the more eccentric at times. And boy, was she. Yeah. She was weird. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't say it any better. Yeah, yeah. 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 I got most of my stuff from, I used Wikipedia. History.com had a huge article on her. So did Biography.com. I'm becoming a big fan of History.com. Yeah, and IsadoraDuncan.org. So there's a foundation actually set up in her name to oh, help dancers. That is amazing. There's a Isadora Duncan dance company right now, mm -hmm. like in New York. I love her name too. That is beautiful. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I thought her name was beautiful, too. I love also, so in that book that Mercedes de Acosta wrote mm -hmm. called Here Lies the Heart, she talked a lot about Eleonora and Isadora. And I was like, that name combination, like, I want to name, if I have children, I'm going to name them <laughs> Isadora and Eleonora because that's such a, that's beautiful, such a beautiful combination. And I was like, I just wanted to see these two women love on each other. I know. <laughs> to be a fly on that wall. <laughs> yeah. Incredible. So that's Isadora Duncan, wow, that the was mother of modern dance. Great. I loved it. What do you got for me? Okay. I'm hoping that I this is the week that I know who you're talking about. This is what? This is going to be the week I know who you're talking about. No, it's not. <laughs> you were like so defensive. You're like, no, it's no, not. No, it's not. It's not happening that way. So my lady, her name is Louise Blanchard Bethune. <laughs> I do know that name. Bethune? Yes. You do? We'll see. I know mm. the name. It's mm. really ringing a bell for me. What a terrible name, though. Like Bethune. going from Bethune. You go from Isadora Duncan <laughs> to, to Louisa Beth Bethune. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, oil and water right there. All right. So she is the first professional architect and engineer in the U.S. Okay. Still think you know her? I know the name. I just probably <laughs> don't actually know who she is. All right. So Louise was born uh, July 21st in 1856 in Waterloo, New York. She was born into a family of educators. So her dad was Dalson M. Blanchard. These are very fun names, by the way. 
Um, he was actually the principal at the Waterloo Union School. Um, he taught mathematics, and her mother, Malona, was a Welsh school teacher, so both educators. Um, they had her homeschooled till she was 11. That seems to be kind of a thing for people who are from wealthier families or like kind of prominent. They were like kind of prominent teachers, so they were able to afford her to have this like private education. So Waterloo is a town that is right next to Seneca Falls, which is the birthplace of women's suffrage movement. Yeah. So it was Waterloo's literally just a town away from that. And it was happening right around that era. So this is like the environment and the atmosphere that she's being raised in. So she begins going to school in Buffalo at the age of 11, where she's she's quoted that a, in quotes, a caustic remark is what made her while in high school, direct her attention to the study of architecture. And to quote again, an investigation which was begun in a spirit of playful self-defense soon became an absorbing interest. So I think that's pretty neat. What was the caustic remark? She never said what the caustic remark was. Now there's like this mystery. I'm like, well, what was that? (laughs) What pissed her off? Apparently. And then like made her kind of want to get back at whatever this was. And then it actually was like, hey, I'm actually digging this. I'm into it. It was probably something like, the girls can't do math. (laughs) (laughs) Girls can't build things. Says exactly in that tone. Followed by a, (laughs) girls can't do that. It's a boy thing. It's a boy thing. So to like a little bit of like her younger education, it was really hard to find a lot of information on her younger education. So it goes from when she graduated in high from high school in 1874. For two years, she traveled and studied in preparation. She wanted to go to Cornell University. Mm -hmm. They had an architecture program there that she wanted to be part of, but she was going to do a little bit of traveling, a little bit of studying, extra education. In those two years, she changed her mind. She didn't want to go to Cornell. Instead, she entered the profession in what they called a more professional way, which is basically you're taking an internship. And she went to apprentice as a draftsman in a professional office. The person was Richard A. Waite. I looked this guy up too. And he was quite a prominent architect. So to be able to get into that office was a pretty big deal for her. And have you ever heard of Richard-ism? No, I don't think so. It's a type of architecture, which is pretty, it's not very exciting. It's a little boring, pretty straight laced, very square, not a lot of fanciful detail or anything like that. So literally the only architect I've ever heard of in my life is Frank Lloyd Wright. Yeah. Like that's it. That's it. That's all I know. So she was hired in this office and it was an established office in Buffalo and she learned her trade through hard work six days a week over a drafting board working on plans for construction sites and studying vast amounts of material in the office library. So he offered her all the like education that she wanted through there. She reportedly purchased, <laughs> this was like noted in the details of her life, which is really funny. She purchased the first woman's bicycle to go on sale in Buffalo. And oh, she wow. was actually an active member of the Women's Wheel and Athletic Club. You know what's really funny? I just was on Amazon the other day looking for books to add to the the high school library. Mm -hmm. And there was this nonfiction book that's supposed to be really good. And it's all about how bicycles are like what powered the feminist movement. And I was like, what? Yeah. And so maybe that's why it made it was a, a big deal? specific note that she was actually and she was part of a club, too. So it's not like she's doing this, you know, in the back alley. She's out there doing it. Yeah, I think that I haven't read that book yet. But what I read of the synopsis was basically like having access to bikes are what really helped mobilize literally and figuratively mobilize mm-hmm. the women's suffrage movement because they could distribute pamphlets. They could get around oh. faster they could have independence from men they didn't need to be taken in cars yeah so bicycles around. really made a huge difference in women's autonomy and independence wow so she was on it so get your bikes out ladies <laughs> hey uh hey, hey uh rita tell, yeah. tell everybody what your bike's name is my bike's name is betty <laughs> and if you want to see all of the travels that her bike goes on you can go on instagram or whatever and search for the hashtag a bike named betty <laughs> it's really betty's cute. my boo 
honestly, being on a bike, there is a freedom to it. So I totally understand where that's coming from. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think it was also, too, because of the way that a woman's positioned on a bike? What do you mean? Physically sitting upon something. You that, mean- that was like scandalous back then. <laughs> I'm just curious on your opinion on that. Oh, it's my like- God. Rita just went to the vagina immediately. It's, it's a problem she has. <laughs> okay, so she's got her bike. <laughs> okay, we're just going to go right past that. We're just going to go right past that. So she soon advanced to becoming a uh, weights assistant. He was that impressed with her architectural skills. So she worked there for over five years. So if you think about how long she would have been in school, a little bit more so. She mastered uh, technical drafting, construction detailing, and the art of architectural design. And it was quoted that she received a man's education, improving her ability in a man's profession. So, oh my goodness, she's smart. Yeah, rock on, bitch, rock on. (laughs) So at the age of 25... She ended up opening up her own office. She was like, I can do this. Yeah. (laughs) Wow. I mean, uh, I guess to me, 25 seems so young. But at the same time, I'm sure there were plenty of 25-year-old men who were opening up their own practices. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. That just, 25 seems young, though. It seems really young. I mean, we're talking the 1800s. Yeah. Yeah. It seems young to me. Very. So this was a time where women were actively pursuing emancipation. In October 1881, the Ninth Congress of the Association for the Advancement of Women convened in Buffalo, where she was at, with 975 women and 25 men voting their beliefs and examining the scientific, artistic, and professional fields for their acceptance of women. So as she's opening up her office, this is happening. She actually gets an announcement made during this Congress that she is opening up this business. So they do mark her at this moment as the first professional female architect. October 1881 is when she opens up the practice. And she takes along a colleague that she met at Waite's office. His name is Robert. And they get married a couple months later. So you know that they were hooking up in that office. Yeah, there's a little office romance there. Oh, could you imagine? He's like, oh, my God, she looks so good on that drafting table. I want to be that bicycle she sits on. <laughs> my girlfriend rides a bike. <laughs> they open up uh, their practice. It's called Bethune and Bethune. <laughs> original yeah I, I was just hoping it would call be called b&b or something so that's how she got the name bethune yes because her first her actual like b- birth name was blanchard Bl- blanchard <laughs> we're I'm talking sorry, bu- yeah. we're talking buffalo i'm y'all. sorry everybody with that last name like it's a fine last name blanchard but her yeah she, yeah it's a fine last name, I promise. To Bethune, I mean... I mean, my original last name was Celia Brigitte, so I don't have anything to fucking say gosh, about that. I feel like that's something that you have to say after someone sneezes. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's like 13 letters long. It has a J and a U in it. Fuck it. <laughs> my maiden name was Villanueva. Yeah, and I love that because then I'm like, oh, you're uh, like Gina. <laughs> Gina Rodriguez's character in Jane the Virgin. Yes. Actually, uh, her her name on that show, Jane Villanueva, that's my mother's name. <laughs> that's crazy. Um, I always like to say, Ziramara. Ziramara. It's a wonderful name. Yeah. So Bethune and Bethune <laughs> is practicing during like a boom time in Buffalo for architectural professions. Uh, the city's growing because of the economic boon because of the Erie Canal. So that bitch is hooking everything up. Lots yeah, of people lots are coming. Of- Lots of trade routes and shit. So I'm imagining like this is like a high flying time for them. You know, yeah. things are new. Thoughts are changing. Progression's happening. Trade is happening. Yep. Cities. Mm-hmm. Cities are being formed. Business and civic leaders are investing in infrastructure. Duh. So high caliber buildings are being wanted now. Things with a little more flair, a little bit more uh, world class is what they called it. In addition, um, architects are breaking out of the master builder tradition. Have you heard of that? No, but I think I can gather what they mean by that. It's, well, I did some research on it and it's, I mean, it goes all the way back to like Greece and like masons and things like that. But it was mostly people just built to build. So this is changing more of... A stance on you're responsible for the health, safety, and welfare of the public with your 
infrastructure. Oh. So this is where like the engineering comes into play. Yeah. So now you're thinking more about like how do we like city planning. Yeah, city yeah. planning. Like how do we make sure that this is going to withstand an earthquake or a flood or something like yeah, that? Yeah, and like proper plumbing, things like that. So her office produced a continuous stream of industrial, commercial, and educational buildings. She actually took quite a liking to designing schools, which I think goes back to her parents being educators. Yeah. A lot of the buildings that she did are still there in Buffalo. And one of them I took a look at, it's called the Iroquois Door Plant Company Warehouse. It looks a lot like Like it's beautiful. Is it Iroquois or Iroquois? Most people say Iroquois. Iroquois. Is the Iroquois what? Iroquois, Iroquois. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> is it route or route <laughs> obviously it's route <laughs> iroquois door plant company warehouse and it's okay. a beautiful building like if you think of the buildings in spokane that are brick and that really nice industrial look of like wood and the windows are big and airy and the glass is green and it's just it's a really beautiful building um, there's pictures of it when it was pretty, it was abandoned, pretty pretty sad looking, and then they redid it, and it looks gorgeous. Another one is the Chandler Street Complex for the Buffalo Weaving Company. Same thing, big, grandiose, industrial looking building, which are going like crazy here in Spokane and being repurposed into breweries and art space and event yeah. centers. So it's quoted, too, that... Most of the firm's designs are utilitarian and indicate tight budget controls. So she was very, very thrifty and she was kind of a red line person. Yeah, use over beauty. Yes. So the cost for some of their plans and what they were building went from $800 to $425,000. That's a lot of money. It's 18... 1881. Yeah. Yeah. That's a lot of fucking money. I mean, that's a lot of money now. Yeah. Could you imagine back then having a budget like that? Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. So tight budget controls and also a good sense of proportion. Discreet handling of decorative elements and thorough knowledge of construction technology. So nice and clean, nice and tidy to the point, I'm assuming. Yeah, well, (laughs) what what that tells me also the use of utilitarian means that like it was always about how a building is going to be used, not whether or not it's pretty. Mm Mm-hmm. Which is awesome because so many people, there's a designer here in Spokane that does not design on that spectrum. And it's mostly about looks. And so many people that live with that design are like, it's non-functional for what they're realistically doing in their business. So yeah, have you ever seen that show on Netflix, The World's Most Extraordinary Homes? No. So most of the homes that they highlight on there are these incredible houses that are also functional. But occasionally they'll have a house on there that is like a work of art in terms of its look, Mm -hmm. but it is completely unusable as a home. And (laughs) so they get to this house, right? The two hosts, Mm -hmm. they're kind of talking about how this is not a home. This is a a building. (laughs) And it's to be looked at, not touched. And to prove it, he goes, I want you to make a cup of tea. (gasps) Oh. And they could not figure out how to make a cup of tea in the kitchen. Oh, my goodness. So, like, that that's an example of architecture gone wild, right? Yeah. Like, it's not, it's not meant to be used as a house. It's meant to be looked at. Yeah. That's, to me, like fondant on cake. Oh, God, that's fondant disgusting. Fondant is fucking gross. It looks beautiful. Like, I'm sorry if some cake makers are listening and you're like, but I like how fondant lays so smoothly and frosting is so hard to get smooth. It tastes like shit. Yeah, it's garbage. (laughs) It looks beautiful, but it's garbage. (laughs) So, yeah, I feel like her design style was just useful and practical. And Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, mostly women are practical people. (laughs) We're like, well, you've got to be able to use the fucking building. Exactly. So at 29 years old in 1885, her professional reputation brought her an invitation and admission to the Western Association of Architects. And so I looked up this group, and there's another group that was an East Coast group uh, called the American Institute of Architects. So this group kind of over, you know, the Western Association, it was like a bunch of men who were kind of like, well, they don't want us in their club, so we're going to make our own club. And yeah, because she's in Buffalo, New York. 
She's yeah. not in the West. Exactly. That's so weird. It's really fucking weird. And so she gets this invitation and admission to this group. And it included some of her ex-colleagues from Buffalo, like uh, other architects that she worked for in Waits Firm. And they knew her well. So they both, they kind of gave like the word and the thumbs up, like she's, she's cool. So they, they were quoted, if the lady is practicing architecture and is in good standing, there is no reason why she should not be one of us. Which is pretty neat it's around pretty that pretty progressive time. for the time. Yeah. They wouldn't let us vote, so. <laughs> working on that one. Her application was voted in, and they also quoted saying, she has done work by herself and has been very successful. She is unanimously elected as a member. So it's like, oh, she's a lady and she can do things. Yeah, but unanimously elected. I mean, that means every single Everybody person believed was in her on work. board and was like, yeah, she's proven herself. So that's saying a lot about who she was yeah. as an architect. So she also started um, the next year in 1886. She was a major organizer of the Buffalo Society of Architects, which became the Buffalo chapter of that American Institute of Architects. In 1888... She was elected the membership of the AIA, and then everything melded together. So all the institutes kind of got over their stuff, all put it in together for the American Institute of Architects, which was pretty cool. And that made her also the first woman uh, to be entered into the AIA since they merged the groups. Yeah. In the AIA, she became also the chapter officer the vice president and the treasurer so girl was good money once again obviously she was working it (laughs) yeah they were like you know what she'll get that job done (laughs) (laughs) so this is crazy too in 1891 she's only 35 that's my age i i'm 34 so yeah she was invited to compete in this women's building for the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago. So it was a contest to build plans and also construct these buildings. She refused to compete because the male architects were appointed to design major buildings and were paid $10,000 for their artistic services only. The women were asked to compete for the artistic design and provide all construction documents for a prize of $1,000. Oh, fuck that. (laughs) I would refuse too. She refused. She wouldn't do it. Yeah. (laughs) Could you imagine that? What a slap in the face. What an insult. Yeah. She's in the the big association of architects. She's a treasurer, whatever she is. Mm -hmm. And they're like, yeah, but you're still second rate. Yeah. You're still a second-class citizen in our group. Fuck you. fuck that shit, yeah. She said that it was against her principle of equal remuneration for equal service. So girl's not getting paid. She's not going to do it. Equal pay for equal work. Exactly. So it jumps over to um, 1904. It's um, her biggest and most famous commission. It was commissioned for a million dollars. This is in 1904. Yeah. That's a freaking So what lot was the commission? Money. The Lafayette Hotel. And it still stands today. And this is in Buffalo? This is in Buffalo, yes. Okay. It's considered one of the 15 finest hotels in the country. It had elevators. It, I know, swanky. High class. And the highlight it says to quote, the highlight of every room was hot and cold water and a telephone. <laughs> That's pretty good. Living in the modern era in the Lafayette. It was a seven-story steel frame concrete building designed in the French Renaissance style, which was a little out of her norm. That's beautiful. I took a look at the building. Like, there's there's a hotel here in Spokane called the Davenport. It's ornate and beautiful and marble and beautiful paintings. And this hotel, similar. Like, it's gorgeous. It seems like most of the time she she was more about function. This was this her one shot. was like I want function, and I want this to be beautiful. Yes. Well, one of the things was described. Um, one of the features was a decorative, vitreous red brick and white terracotta trim. So I went when I was looking at photos of this building. It's stunning. Like the color of the brick and the white trim. It's beautiful. In uh, 2012, somebody bought it and they did a renovation on it. It took 35 million dollars to renovate that building. 
<laughs> yeah, in today's money, that's that's I that would be about right. That's a but minute. and she made it for a million right at the yep, beginning. In the beginning, there was additions added on and then taken off, and there were some things that you know people paint stuff or they they modernize yeah. it and they ruin it, and so this was what the restoration was to kind of bring it back to its original glory. They did that to the Davenport. They did, yeah, in the two thousands or whatever. I had no idea about that when I first moved to Spokane. Because I just remember going to the Davenport because people are like, you should go. It's really beautiful. And I was like, oh, yeah, this is like, this is gorgeous. And they were like, it was trash. It was like garbage. It was like, it was burned out, hollowed out. Y'all, we live in this city where like, it went through a period in the 80s and 90s where like the whole city was just garbage. Like it was basically the entire city was terrible. Terrible. Yeah. It was drug dens everywhere serial killer problems we have a lot of serial killer problems yeah (laughs) and it was just bad like my sister lived here for a brief time in brown's edition and when i was moving here everybody was like move to brown's edition and so when my sister found out i was moving here she was like don't live in brown's edition why (laughs) because when she was there oh yeah it was like everybody had needles hanging out of their arms and you know she could hear screaming at night. Oh, jeez. She only lived here for like six months and she was like, I'm getting the fuck out of here. This place is disgusting. <laughs> so she moved back to Montana and that was the reputation Spokane had even when I was moving here. It was like, oh, it's a garbage city and it's really had quite a renaissance Yeah. since then. And all of those, like Rita was saying, all of these old buildings that have been dilapidated and neglected are seeing renovations happening there's like the big huge company that's redoing this huge building downtown that has just been a blight in the downtown landscape mm-hmm. and they're making it into a boutique hotel oh right I'm over so by excited. where one tree cider is and stuff. oh yeah yeah there's a big building right across the street there mm-hmm. that's what they're renovating oh that's amazing I think it's called the otis it is the otis yeah yeah so i mean that that kind of stuff like when you redo and really put love and time and effort into a city it just it changes it. Yeah. You know, I imagine that when this, whoever it was that decided Saw to this redo the Lafayette was thinking this piece of history needs to be recognized mm-hmm. for its glory again. On pictures for the website for the Lafayette, they take really close up details of the architecture. The windows are so beautiful. Oh. The panes are so delicate. And then it's got those pillars with the filigree on top that looks like leaves blooming and it's just beautiful i love that kind of stuff i am a sucker for old architecture like Mm -hmm. just stuff that looks real old like that i really love that stuff i was looking to um through some of um there's not a lot of records of her firm's doings like just obviously probably lost through time but there was one that was like a it almost looked like a catalog page but it was for the architect's Uh, reference and it was a bunch of doors and it had like um, it said like standard garage door and then it said something something French door and it had them each priced (laughs) and these look like stuff that you would find at like Pottery Barn right now for a couple thousand dollars they were like restoration hardware yeah exactly dollar fifty (laughs) Four fifty <laughs> for garage doors. For yeah. a door. Yeah. Aww. And I was like, oh my goodness. Prices yeah. move up. Yeah. A, a different time. Yeah. One thing they did offer too was like the different panes of glass. You could do like standard like straight, like it would be straight and then cut in half and then have like colored glass on the top. Or you can have like a floral design in there or you can have something else. I, I love the little details like that, like finishing stuff. I love that really stuff pretty. too. Uh, So she ended up retiring in 1908 at 52 years old. She died shortly after that at 59. So that's young, very young. It didn't say if she was sick. It didn't say anything else other than designing the Lafayette really took it out of her. Apparently, like it was a labor of love and not surprising that it's one of the last things that's standing. That's hers in 1910 between the time where she retired and she died. There was approximately 50 women working professionally as architects. And a quote from her is, the future of a woman in the architectural profession is what she herself sees fit to make it. One thing I've noticed like reading stuff about her is she was very straight to the point. 
she was kind of no excuses, which I think reflects in how she designed, how she managed money, how she kind of dealt with people, which I thought was really neat. I uh, like this lady. I think that's, that's that's wonderful. I do think that the fact that she came from pretty a pretty prominent, fairly wealthy family, it sounds like, mm-hmm. gave her quite a bit of a leg up mm-hmm. in the world, especially because she got into that weights firm or whatever. Yeah. One thing I was wondering if you saw anything about, so she started out immediately as a drafter. Mm-hmm. Did she have any training in drafting before she went to apprentice at this firm? At the firm? Not that I noted, but what it was, I think she started studying in high school because that's when they said that her architecture or for her love and interest for architecture was sparked. So I figured that's where she kind of, I don't find, found her inspiration in yeah. it. Maybe she was going to the library and getting books and stuff on yeah. it. There's a student in my library right now who started doing that. He came in the other day and he's like, do we have any books on architecture? <gasps> really? Yeah. And I was like, yeah, we do. And I took him over to the section and there were a couple of newer books on architecture. It had real cool full color paintings and, yeah. or, or portraits and photos and, you know, draft plans. No, no. He went for the oldest, mustiest book on the shelf. Oh my goodness. Because he wanted to look at how architecture really like started and mm-hmm. what the foundation is. And he came and got another one. Oh, I love it. You know, this is like, this is a moment. And he has been, he's a kid I see every single day. He comes to the library and sits alone, puts his headphones on and he plays a video game. That's all he does every day. He doesn't eat lunch. Hmm. Doesn't, And he's like real pale. Eyes are always sunken in. He looks real sad Ooh, all the time. That's not good. And this is the first time I've seen him like, kind of perk up a little bit he's real interested in this i don't know what sparked it i don't know where it came from but i was so happy to say yeah we've got books on that yeah yeah you can take these yeah you can study them and then now i see him like occasionally having the book open and he's got a little <gasps> pencil oh little... he's sketching <laughs> so you're it, it's funny that you brought up this woman because like this just happened oh this that's amazing is, like, having a spark lit for him you never know where that spark's going to come from yeah. And I I kind of thought to myself too that since her dad was in mathematics me and it said too that she had an affinity for mathematics like maybe that came into, you know, was able to work like with her brain and architecture was just one way she could build it, put it down more on like a brick and mortar rather than just on paper. I love hearing about women who are good at math. Yeah. Because we have such a pervasive stereotype that girls aren't good at math. Boys are good at math and science. Girls are good at English and writing and all that flowery stuff. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, is that everyone has an app, like everybody can have an aptitude for a given subject. Mm -hmm. And it, it is not defined by our gender or our perceived gender. No. You know, you can be good at math and be a girl. You can be good at writing and be a boy and obviously we know that because all the famous writers in the world (laughs) until like the 20th century were men yeah so it's it's nice and refreshing to hear about a woman who a long time ago was like i have an affinity for math and i'm gonna take it and run with it Mm -hmm. one thing i found really fascinating too about this person was that uh, my dad is a builder and he started his own company when i was really little and i was about Ooh, like three years old, I think three or four when he started this company. And growing up, he would do like architectural plans for people like as he was getting more and more into it. And he would do drafting. So my dad had a drafting table. And he always had that like really cool blue grid paper. I love that. Stuff. <laughs> I love the that. Stuff. <laughs> They're literally blue. I love that. Yes. So he had this paper and he had all the stencils for like all the different um, like radiuses for circles and different uh so like you could draft faster and there were like templates and they were green and clear and he had like big ones but he also had like the templates for like toilets and sinks and light fixtures so he would draft and I would I would kind of like watch him draw these you know these plans and I'd ask him like you know what does this mean like you've got this wall and this wall but you got wavy lines in between it and he goes oh, okay so here's your key so look at the key what's a wavy line and the wavy line meant um, insulation and then like here and here like there's this little circle but it's only half colored in what does that mean that's a light fixture and a light fixture needs to be every 14 feet in a room so like he was wow, teaching me all this that's different fascinating. stuff fascinating so he ended up giving me 
a piece of paper and he would let me design things. So I like designed my own house. And I mean, I had like a a 60 foot wide living room and stuff like that. <laughs> I was going to have I want all a football this... <laughs> field inside my living room. My dr- I, so I, I drafted like my dream home. So he let me do this and or he didn't let me. He just encouraged me. He's like, here, you know, make something. And I remember my house was so grossly huge because we did not have a large house and I did not even have my own bedroom. So I was designing <laughs> all the space in the world. <laughs> and uh, two, like how to put doors in. And um, I think I was designing a bathroom and he's like, okay, think about how big your door is and your door frame. When you open that, you're going to hit your toilet seat. You can't open that door. So you got to, so kind of like spatial design and stuff like that. So this really hit a note with me because I really, really enjoyed that growing up. I never, I had, love that. You've never talked I've about that never before. never talked about that. No. And it's something new I'm learning about you that I absolutely <laughs> adore. I think that's incredible that your dad did that and that he taught you all of these things. Mm-hmm. Like someday you could potentially sit down with whoever if you ever get your dream home right Mm -hmm. sit down and say this is what this is what i want this is what i want here and you could actually read the plans like i'd be like oh my god this looks great (laughs) because i don't know fuck i don't know anything about it there it's actually really fascinating especially with like because it's two-dimensional and you're trying to (laughs) get people to think three-dimensional space so they use a lot of shading and like hash marks and like one thing i always love too is staircases So if it was like a spiral staircase, they would hash mark it a certain way so that it would look almost 3D and it would show you that you're moving on to the second floor. And then that's your new piece of paper. And then you would have to do all all the same dimensions, but then like your different rooms and things like that. And even down to where your plugs are going to meet up for your washer and dryer upstairs to your toilet downstairs, like... That's all so the cool. inner guts and working. So this really struck a note with me because I like I'm I kind of am sad I never pursued anything in that, but I love design and looking at buildings and especially old buildings, they fascinate me. Like the house that you guys used to be in, like when you showed me the old button mm-hmm. light switches, like I love stuff like that because it's just like a little piece of something that we don't have anymore and it's yeah. kind of neat to touch it and think of the people who touched it before you and yeah I love living in a house with history yes and architecture is just beautiful the things that you can do and and architecture is fascinating to me also because it's been around forever, forever. yeah you know the first people to create a livable space that protected them from the elements mm-hmm. were architects mm-hmm. that's what they were doing and I think that that's incredible to have the kind of brain that says i know what this could do and i know how to make it better Mm -hmm. very cool yeah i'm glad we had that conversation i learned something new about rita (laughs) yay (laughs) well thank you for joining us oh thank you much hopefully uh, enjoyed this episode yeah i hope you join us next time see you next time bye (laughs) okay bye